Hey, Jesse, how are you? Good to meet you. Yeah, I'm doing good, man. Nice to meet you, too. Just to kind of kick things off here, um, I do want to get a little bit of your background. Um, I love to hear kind of the origin story for, for you know, every one of my guests. So, you know, kind of what got you here, but really think about it, sort of what are your superpowers or really your guiding kind of leadership principles and, and where did that come from? Yeah, I mean, the origin story for Sweater, uh, that started, I guess it's been just over four years ago now. Um, I actually went out to start my own VC fund in... Uh, in Arizona, which really doesn't have a lot of like formal institutional capital for startups. And I'd been there for five or six years and just no, no one had ever done it. And I kind of looked around and said, I could do this. Like, why, why am I waiting for someone else to go and do this? So I started going through the process of formalizing a fund and it was made readily apparent very quickly that I would not be allowed to invest in my own fund because I was not an accredited investor. And I thought that was pretty stupid. I mean, I knew about the accreditation rules before that, um, but I, I'd never really been the one locked out of something that I needed to do. And so it made me look at it a little bit closer. And I was mostly curious. I, I mean, there were ways that I could have finagled my way through it and still built the fund, but I was mostly curious. And part of my graduate work was in uh, policy. So um, I decided to, to dig into the policy behind accreditation rules and really figure out where they came from, what the justification was, why we still have them, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I really didn't like the answer I found when I did that, because in so many words, the justification is if you're not wealthy, then you're probably not smart enough to understand this really complicated stuff. And we need to protect you mostly from yourself, you know, and I just that lit me on fire. I was like, if I fall into that category and I have all these friends and family that are very well educated, very smart people fall into that category, then this is absolutely archaic and this needs to change. And so that's what lit the fire under me. And I, I dropped the idea of doing a traditional VC fund and started running after this. So um, it took a long time to get an audience with the right people at the SEC, finally did, figured out a pre-existing pre -existing fund structure that we adapted to operate in this environment and for these purposes and um, raised some venture money for ourselves, which is kind of inception. You know, we, uh, you know, we raised VC money for a VC fund, which is a very different kind of concept. Um, and then, you know, we hit the market about four months ago and it's been an exciting heck of a ride since then. So to the moon. Oh, that's incredible. Good. I, I, you know, I, I'm an angel investor and, uh, I've been involved in, so same, same kind of thing. The traditional, even angel fund kind of has this buy minimum buy-in of about maybe 25 grand a check. And, uh, I'm a diversification junkie. And so for me, it was sort of like, well, I just, you know, I don't want to throw all my eggs in just a few baskets and I'm not, you know, a retired rich doctor or whatever with money to burn. And so I, I've been chasing after some of these diversified uh, type of models on like the seed and angel side. And um, so there's some some seed syndicates and, and kind of angel funds and things like that. So I'm loving this trend of kind of democratizing um, investing that's sort of non-public investing. So... Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many more options than there were 10 years ago, you know, and, you know, the the angel investor market is actually a super interesting one. Just as like an aside, um, we're getting interest from that world that we didn't expect. I mean, like on day one, when we first created this, we created truly for the little guy, you know, $500 minimum. We want anyone to be able to participate. People who literally can't do this at all in a meaningful way. We wanted them to be able to come in. And that was day one. But when we started putting the message out there, we started getting all this feedback from accredited investors, you know, guys making 500, 800 grand a year who were like, you know, I want exposure to this asset class, but I don't have the time for this. I, I don't want to go to angel groups and I don't always understand what's going on. I, I don't feel comfortable conducting my own due diligence and then taking care of all this paperwork and everything and and doing all this individual stuff after the fact, you know, it's, it's a pain in the neck and I don't want to do it. So what you guys are doing is awesome. I mean, I could write you a hundred thousand dollar check and then sign up for two or three grand a month and just let it run. And I don't have to do anything. And we were like, well, yeah, that's, that's true. You know, it's, it, that wasn't our original purpose, but you know, in, in the process of that, we discovered that um, there are about 13 million accredited households in the U S and only about 250,000 registered angel investors. So even 97, 98% of the accredited market doesn't touch startups because of the complexities and, you know, really the, the perceived amount of work and maintenance that's required to deploy money into the category. So it's been very surprising. Yeah, 
Yeah. No, I, I've, I've experienced it myself. You know, I'll get, a, I'll go to these angel functions and some founders will get up there and they'll be talking about some sort of fancy life sciences or biotech sort of thing. And I'll be like, oh, that's incredible. That's great. Wow. I'm, I'm all in. And then the folks with the experience would be like, no, 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 no. That's some crazy thing. It's never going to work, you know? And then likewise, I'm a tech guy, right? And so then some SaaS founder will come up there and everyone's like, that's great. That's amazing. And then I'll be like, no, 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 no. That's never going to work, you know? <laughs> So uh, yeah, no, the domain, the 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 domain experience, the you know, just understanding of the business model and whatnot at that stage is is definitely a barrier to entry. So uh, anything you can do to knock it down is wonderful. Um, before I, I want to dive deeper into it, but I want to kind of back up a little bit and just get to know you a little bit more. Um, so you have a like a finance background, right? You were um, you're a consultant, a coach. You've you've worked as sort of a fractional CRO, things like that. But and so what what What's your what's your path that got you to where you are now? <laughs> let's let's classify it as uh, non traditional. <laughs> um, I I fell into uh, I fell into startups fifteen years ago, kind of on accident. I did this uh, internship in Europe uh, with this very entrepreneurial family, um, and they they ran uh, six or seven businesses, and I got to participate in had my fingers in all these businesses that they were running. And it was so cool. I was just like, wow, like I didn't realize that you could do this for a living. I thought the only thing I had in my head at that age was pretty much just going to work for corporate or go do consulting at, you know, BCG or something was all I had my eye on. Um, and so it really opened my eyes and I, I fell in love with this notion of doing your own thing. Um, and after that, the, the financial crisis hit and kind of got a reality check, decided to go to grad school, uh, got my MBA at Thunderbird School of Global Management, did a dual degree with the Vermont Law School in environmental policy and uh, thinking I was going to get into clean tech and specifically on the finance side of clean tech, you know, so utility scale, uh, wind and solar and like that sort of thing is where I was going. And then that market just crapped the bed. And in 2011, it all fell apart and nobody was hiring for anybody <laughs> for any, any roles, much less uh, someone new to the industry. And despite being qualified, there just wasn't anything there. And that's where I fell into venture capital. So a friend of mine kind of walked me into a, a startup accelerator that was getting going. And I had, you know, a lot more entrepreneurial exposure than, than most people did that they were talking to. And I got my shot to work at this place. And they ended up actually raising a small VC fund um, and got me exposed on that side of the equation as well. And I worked with hundreds of companies in that capacity. Um, you know, my really my, my finance I say I got a degree in entrepreneurial finance, um, you know, so fund finance and, you know, finance at the earliest stages of a company and, and how you can try to predict the future with the very little information that you have to give you a better semblance of whether or not you're on track. And I'm very, very good at that. Um, but that's kind of translated into a lot of stuff. So I worked for a lot of, you know, several different private companies. Um, I, I ran, I did some random stuff. I, I ran a lead gen agency for a couple of years because I kind of had a chip on my shoulder for a variety of reasons. Um, but I love finance. I love startups. Um, and you know, more than anything though, like I, I love working with ideas that can, you know, shape the world that we live in. And that's ultimately what it all comes back to for me. So whether I'm doing it or whether I'm helping to enable someone else that they can make their dream and vision a reality is really where I get my passion from. Oh, that's wonderful. I have a strangely similar backstory, uh, similar time frame too. Yeah. So I, I graduated from college in 2004, and I went and got my MBA in entrepreneurship. Uh, and same thing, I was kind of working for a big company, and I really loved, I was in love with with entrepreneurship, wanted to form a startup. And then the financial crisis happened. And so I went underneath sort of the big ship, right? But um, I also have a passion for clean tech, and climate change is really my cause. And so during and after kind of the whole financial crisis, I was uh, kind of advent, uh, advising and mentoring clean tech startups during when we called it sort of like the green, whatever, the green <laughs> thing back in the day. And, um, and it was very, very hard to help them raise money. That was the main thing, right? Very, very long sort of development cycles required a lot of capital uh, and not a lot of appetite for it. And so even to this day, you know, I actually have kind of like a clean tech 
you know, discount that I provide because I want to support that cause. Um, but similarly, I struggled for many, many years to really establish a foothold in that industry. And so it's kind of like, um, um, well, pro bono, I'm on a board of a couple things on a couple tech committees, um, around clean tech, but you know, it's, it's been, it's been tough, but hopefully, you know, some of this new legislation and some movements in the market are going to bolster support for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly resurrected itself as climate tech, right? It's been, um, very interesting to kind of see it come back. I mean, for a little while there, I was like watching, you know, impact investing and almost everything in impact investing between, you know, 2015 and like 2020, it seemed to be all clean tech stuff. I'm like, this is just clean tech rebranded as, as impact investing. And then uh, climate tech has really taken root the last two or three years and uh, is gaining a lot of traction. And it's, that seems like a better home for it, but. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so, so obviously, you know, you're, you're a, a staunch environmentalist, you live in, in Boulder, Colorado, and, uh, you, you like to punish yourself. So tell me, tell me about this, uh, endurance sports that you're into. Uh, well, first I got to say, there's a lot of parallels between endurance sports and entrepreneurship is, is my personal feeling, but no, nah, I mean, I, I've, I've been on the, you know, kind of the weekend warrior guy, you know, doing a lot of, uh, I've done. Uh, what seven Ironmans uh, races? I've done uh, marathons, and you know I've done backcountry trail running stuff. You know endurance, you know kind of like uh, unsanctioned sort of things. I've done a lot of cycling races, um, and I just fell in love with it. I mean, it's funny. I, I discovered it maybe back in 2016, 2017, and I was always a ball sports guy. It was like if I chase a ball around, I don't care what it is, I'll be happy. And I, I never wanted to go and run in a straight line, you know, that sounded like terrible. And somebody challenged me to go do a triathlon. And I was, you know, it was probably kind of a prideful moment. And I was like, well, of course I could do a triathlon like that, whatever, you know, and he got me to sign up for it. And I started training and I, I had never, uh, I'd never swam laps ever. Like swimming was like playing in a pool, you know, like playing basketball in a pool. That was like my idea of swimming. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd never done cycling, you know, like I'd like ride around the block with my kids kind of a thing, you know, and I'd never ran more than probably two miles at a time because that's all that you would ever do playing sports. Otherwise, you're, you know, you're, you're on a sprints or whatever. Um, and it kicked my butt. I, I remember doing this race and there were all these older guys and teenagers and stuff that beat me. And I was like, man, I can do better than that. So I signed up for the same race on the same course again three months later and I actually really tried and trained for it. And I got myself a real bike. and. Uh, blew away the first time I did. And I was like, oh, that was pretty good. Like, yeah, like kind of patting myself on the back. And the guy that I, that originally invited me to do it, he was like, Hey, you know, I'm doing this Ironman in St. George. I wonder if you could do it. And of course it kind of like, maybe I'm a prideful person. I don't know. But I was like, Oh, I could do that. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into and, um, ended up training for this thing. And, you know, you, you get in the middle of it and all of a sudden you just, like your body changes and you, your, your mind changes, you figure out where all these mental blockers are in your head that don't need to be there. You know, it's just like preconceived notions of what difficult is and what's possible. And you start breaking through those and all of a sudden, you know, you can do anything. It's just a matter of training and how much you want it to hurt while you do it, you know, and how long you're going to hurt afterwards. <laughs> and, um, I've fallen in love with it. I mean, I've, yeah. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so this is this is the saying they say um, it never stops hurting. You just go faster is basically the notion. Right. But but that's the thing, like it, it hurts, but like you get to a level where where the hurt feels good in a way. You know, like I, I went out and did a trail run this morning and it was like 10 miles and it was so it was like five miles up uphill and then five miles downhill. And on the downhill, I felt awesome. I was just crushing it, you know, and like I've been faster before. But the speed that I chose on the way down the hill just felt awesome. And my body was prepared for that speed in that moment. And like I was working really hard and I was pushing myself to the edge, but it felt amazing. And, you know, there's something about that kind of a release where it's like, yeah, you know, there's there's some pain involved. But at the same time, it's strangely satisfying. And so I, you can train and achieve absolutely anything. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So that, there's a lot of parallels there with with, with coaching as well. So I, I think of my clients as intellectual athletes. 
right? Intellectual endurance athletes because game time is every single day. Um, and I'm trying to prepare them mentally and physically and emotionally for that that marathon that never ends or doesn't end for at least five years or so. Uh, and it is all, I think about that, breaking barriers, right? Knocking down dominoes or breaking out of, of containers um, that are holding us back. So what are what were some of the some of the things that stood out to you when you were going through this training process, were there any points where you really felt like I can't do this or I don't know how to break through it? Or was there something where you just, you didn't see it. And then once you saw it, you were able to break through it. I guess it would depend on the event, you know, uh, and the sport. So they're all just a little different. It's funny. Cause you'd think that like, well, you know, if I go run a marathon, if I train for a marathon, run a marathon, then I should be able to hop on a bike and go ride a hundred miles. And you can, but it's a different type of fitness, even though they're both endurance, you know, like you're using muscles in a different way. Your body's in a different position. Uh, the mental barriers are a little bit different, you know. Um, but I mean, I've, I've had some very painful events where I just wasn't prepared or something went sideways or whatever. Um, but, you know, you get to this point, like I'm at a point now where I'm like, oh, I know I could do it. Like, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Like once you do a full Ironman. You know, I mean, that's that's a 12 to 14 hour event or, or longer for, for some folks, you know, and you go through an event like that and you come back and you're like, I just did that. Like, I can literally do anything. And then you get kind of cocky, <laughs> you know, then you're like, you don't prepare for stuff and then it hurts more than it should. And you're like, ah, God, I should have trained harder. But then there's this funny thing about like, you know, you talk about breaking through barriers, ceilings or whatever. And when you first start, everything is a ceiling, you know, it's like. I've never run five miles at once before. And it's intimidating. You're like, well, I, okay. You know, I've run two, I've run three, you know, like it, it hurt. I remember that feeling like five, like five feels like a really long ways. And then, you know, you, you learn how to pace yourself. You do this stuff and you come out the other side and yeah, it hurt, but you did it. And now, you know, you can always run five miles and that's not the barrier anymore. Right now, the new barrier is like, well, geez, 10, can you imagine running 10 miles? Right. And then, you know, and then it's the same thing and you work your way up and then pretty soon you're prepared and then you go do 10 miles and you're like, holy crap, I did it, you know? And every single time you do that, it's just like, I don't know. It's, it, you, you amaze yourself at what you can achieve, but you also acknowledge that you couldn't have just gone out and done that on day one, you know? And so it's, it's this buildup of, uh, of strength, which is a real thing. You can't fake the strength, like you have to train, but it's also so much in your head. and you know, it's like, I, I have not been training for a marathon, or, but I could probably go out. I could run 26 miles today after I ran the 10 miles this morning. I know I could go out and do that. It's going to hurt like crazy and I'm not going to enjoy myself and I'm going to be really sore for probably a week, but I could struggle through that if I had to. And so, yeah, I mean, there's just something about it. I don't know, like, especially when you're in the beginnings of learning the sp these sports, right? There's always, you're just constantly breaking through these. And again, the parallels with, with entrepreneurship are, are readily apparent. Um, I, I'm an executive coach, and, and a lot of clients that I deal with, they come to me almost looking for a consultant. They want me to just tell them the final, the final solution, the final answer. And, I, and I've done that. And, the, and it's just, oh, it's too much work, right? Or it's too far, it's too far of a gap. And I've learned and, and kind of evolved as a coach to say, well, I can show you what the, what the whole mountain looks like. But first, I got to get you to base camp, and then I got you to get, you know, got to get you to camp two and three and, and so on. And so breaking down something really large and challenging into these small incremental challenges is, is kind of the name of the game. And I'm, I'm still, uh, still learning. There isn't, there, isn't a, there isn't a regimen the way there may be in something like training for an Ironman. It, it's kind of like, well, we have to figure out what is the shape of this particular mountain that is your life or your business, and then how do we break it down into into digestible challenges. Yeah. And that's awesome. I mean, that's exactly the way you have to do it. You know, it's like, you really shouldn't just go out and run a marathon, right? Like, even though you might be able to, it's going to be a terrible experience. But like you said, I mean, break it down into mm, achievable chunks that you can grow your, what, your way into, and you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. And I think that that's very true, you know, mentally and like considering your own capabilities to just look around and be like, well, I could never do what that guy does or that person, you know, it's like, that's just, that's out of my league. There's no way I could ever get there. When reality is like, yeah, you can absolutely do that. And that's something that I've loved about being in this, in this job. I mean, like venture capital is, it's kind of a, 
you know, I don't know, the top of the food chain in, in a lot of ways, depending on the context that you're in. And so it can, I remember before I was officially on this side of the table, I was on the founder side of the table a lot, talking to the venture capitalists, talking to the angel investors. And I remember being very intimidated, you know, like these, these people know more than me, like they have so much experience. They see all these companies, like I'm, I'm really not that capable. And like, they're going to see right through me, like total imposter syndrome. And it's funny because you get on the other side and it, I don't know, it's like, it's like getting into any kind of club, you know, it's like you get in and all of a sudden you're just one of everybody. And, you know, you, you look around and you're like, wait a minute, like everybody's totally normal, you know? And like they, they, they put their pants on one leg at a time. They have all these issues in their life. Like they have so many things they don't know the answers to. They have blind spots all over the place, you know, and they, they get lucky too, you know, not, nobody has this all seeing eye. And when you realize that all of a sudden you're like, Hey, well, I could do this, you know, like this is, it's like, yeah, I mean, you got to start on the scale and work your way up. Right. I mean, there, it's just like being well-trained for an event. You can add up experience that makes you really good at what you do. But that's the thing is that the path becomes very clear and you know that you can get there. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I, again, I work with a lot of early stage founders and similar kind of thing, right? They see these successful executives and they think they're somewhat different. No, they've just gone through more cycles than you, right? They've gone through multiple companies. And so I, I was actually giving a talk at a conference several years ago and somebody in the audience asked me, you know, what's kind of like the number one, like key to success as a, as a startup founder. And I thought about it. And my answer was, you know, for right or wrong, it was to have already done it before and probably failed to some degree, right? But there is no substitute for experience. No, I totally agree. And like, uh, yeah, I mean, like the failure thing is so good though. You know, I think um, some communities, startup communities have done a good job of recognizing how valuable failure is. Others still have it as a big stigma. Um, I mean, like locally, like here in the US, like individual pockets will have that stigma. It's, it's more pronounced when you go to other cultures, you know, like if you're in Asia, um, it's failing is a huge problem, you know, and if you failed, like, I mean, you might not ever get another shot because no one will ever trust you again, but here it's different. It's like, oh, you went through the, the steps and the pain and the shutting of it, shutting it down, like all these things. I mean, like, there's no way to understand those feelings and that pressure without going through the pressure cooker. You know, you can read about it all you want, right? But like when you know that feeling and you see the signs and you recognize all the stuff you did wrong, the next time you go and do it, I mean, this is the fallacy is that people look at it and say, oh, well, you failed. And they somehow think that you're going to go make all the same mistakes again, which is absurd that we would think that. But that's kind of the like the correlation that we make in our minds that like if you failed, you're going to repeat it. It's like, no, no, like, you know, that feeling. And, and it's like every scenario you're going to go into is going to be dramatically different than the last one you were in. But there's all these keys and like, you know, you, you can see the potholes, you can understand the feeling and the sense and you read the emotions from people and you can see all this stuff and it just makes you better at what you do. Yeah. 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 You've been burned by that stove. You're not going to touch that stuff again. Yeah. Well, so you, you have experience again on the founder side. What were some of the lessons that you learned that you kind of take with you to today? Oh, yeah. Where do you start? Um, you know, the one I probably share the most often is that if you want to be successful as a founder, uh, your number one priority is personal financial survival. If you can solve that, then you can build anything. And I, I illustrate this a bunch. So with, with one experience that I had and then and contrasting it with what happened with Sweater. So I started a different company um, back in 2013, 14 timeframe, left my job for it like was really going after it. It was an interesting moment in time for the thing that we were doing. Um, and after the fact, I learned that there was a lot of stuff I didn't know, which is one of the things I learned. But the, the fallacy or the, the problem that I encountered was that I didn't prepare myself well enough financially for the experience. I had some money set aside and then I had this notion in my head of how long it was gonna take for me to go and raise money. That was my first, I guess, premonition was I gotta go raise money but I didn't have enough money to have created the traction points and the validation needed to actually raise the money. So I was caught between this rock and a hard spot because I was trying to raise money, but I didn't have enough evidence for me to be able to actually succeed in that. 
And so I burned through the little capital that I had, basically going down this path in vain where I didn't have enough there to actually have achieved that thing. And I figured that out towards the end of it. But by that point, it was too late. And I was out of personal capital. I couldn't do it anymore. I was basically just living off of a savings account. Actually, worse than that, I was living off of a HELOC. And I was just digging myself into a hole, thinking that, well, I'm going to come out the hole on the other side when I raise money. And I was just totally the wrong mentality. And I put myself in a very bad financial position coming out of that. Ended up getting a job, total miracle, to allow me to feed my kids, basically, you know, and, and take care of my family. And I was just... I was so mad that I had messed it up. And um, the, it was interesting because I ended up working for a startup and I helped them raise capital, which is also ironic. <laughs> um, and that was a good experience to go through that with them and remember that like, yeah, I know, I know what I'm doing. Like, I, I understand this world. I'd worked for that accelerator before, you know, and that stung too because I was helping all these other people do this. And then I failed myself when I went to do it. And then I helped someone else do it. You know, so I had a big chip on my shoulder. But what I, what I learned from this other startup that I helped was I saw their story and they started out as a services agency basically. And they had great cash flow and they used that cash flow to hire developers that came in and built a piece of software that was servicing their, their paying clients for exactly what they wanted. They were able to roll that software out to a waiting base. They got all this revenue. They had great traction. They had big brand names and they found success. Really, I mean, in, in so many words, easily. I mean, it's never easy, but like compared to other startups, they had a pretty smooth path. And I, I learned from them and I thought, you know what? I need to learn how to survive on my own without raising money, without anything else. I need to go out and prove that I can actually generate the type of returns necessary for me to survive. And when I figure that out, I will come back to the venture game. And so that's why I did this lead gen agency thing that I told you about earlier, just briefly. And so I actually, I learned that skill working for that company because they raised money and they needed to start being much more aggressive and nobody knew how to do it. And I, I raised my hand and I said, I'll figure it out. And so I started this whole outbound email lead gen thing back in 2015, 2016 timeframe. And it was very new back then. Um, and it's, it's very much not the easiest technique now, but back then it was novel. And we were going through this and it was working. And I thought, you know what? I can sell this. Like I could do this for other people. And so I left that job and I started picking up my own clients and I figured out how to survive on my own. And that survival and the confidence that I had is what allowed me to do sweater because sweater was a long haul, man. I mean, it's, it was three years. Well, it's been four years till now for us to launch publicly and actually take money into the fund. It took three years for me to actually get a paycheck. So I worked for three years on this thing with my underlying business, basically paying all my bills and taking care of my, my, rather large family. I've got five kids and it took care of all of my financial needs while we went through this process and got all the, the validation and all the foundational items we needed to be able to actually raise money and, and push sweater out into reality. Um, and it, it's, it's like my success story. And I see so many founders that make this mistake that they, they fixate too much on raising money and not enough on generating revenue or figuring out how to survive on their own. And you know, and then they get caught in these quagmires and these, they paint themselves into a corner and then they fail, not because the thing they're working on wasn't worthwhile or wouldn't work, but because they couldn't survive. So that's my, that's my number one thing I like to share because too many founders miss the boat on that. No, it's wonderful. So that, you know, painting yourself into a corner, I always say, you know, you never want to have to make decisions out of desperation, right? You want to make them out of confidence. And if you've got, if your money's drying up and, you know, or, or whether for yourself or for your team, it'll force you to make compromising decisions that will, that will sacrifice your future. Um, so that is, that is great advice. Another thing too, in fact, I even wrote an article about this just a week or so ago around um, providing a service, right? So a lot of founders are outsiders where they come up with an idea to create a platform that's very expensive to serve a market um, that they're not really a part of and not connected with and don't really understand. And so a lot of my guidance and coaching is around go provide a service first, right? Find out something you can do for money at a small scale so that you can understand your customers, connect with them, understand their problems, provide a service, and then use that cash flow to go fund the automation or the scale up of whatever those services are that you're providing. 
Um, and I've actually coached several early stage founders away from, I've talked them off the ledge of going and building an expensive SaaS platform, and they built very successful agencies, which they have then turned into, into a, a cash flow for, for building the product. So, um, so it's great. You finally figured it out all on your own. <laughs> Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. Mhm. Mm Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I mean, that's, that's sort of, you know, how I got in this business is I have the experience, I have the perspective, and yeah, you can go on and do it yourself, or I can just give you some advice as a consultant, but in order to really help you sort of force multiply or, or even cut out several of the steps, um, you know, that's what I'm here to do. So I, I want to shift a little bit and, and talk about venture capital, uh, specifically around sweater, but then I have some more general questions too, because this is an area that I'm really curious about uh, and I'd like your take on. But first, let's let's talk about Sweater Venture. So it's been a few years, you got this up and running, and you've just recently launched, right? So you're, you're, you're providing opportunity for anyone to come in and get in on, on venture deals. So tell me a little bit, like, what are some of the... What, kind of what are the profiles or what stage of company are you looking at um, and how does this work? Yeah, so um, you know, the basics of how it works is we, we have a, a specific designation or fund structure with the SEC that allows us to accept money from anyone. So it could be retail investors, accredited, non-accredited, qualified investors, institutional, angel investors, like it doesn't matter. We could take money literally from anyone and we pool that money together and then we're able to have a professional deal team here um, that goes out into the world and finds the very best companies that have the right DNA set um, to be able to qualify to be in these high growth categories that venture capital requires. We build relationships with these founders um, and then we find the ones that fit our thesis, which I can make mention more of. And we, as we develop these relationships and we make these investments, then everyone that is a part of Sweaters Fund gets to benefit from the the pluses and minuses of, of making investments. And we create that portfolio on your behalf to offset that greater risk profile that comes with investing in high growth companies. So that's the basics of how it works. And it, we, we deliver the whole thing through a mobile app, you know, which is really unique. I mean, VC funds are typically, you know, require a quarter million or half a million dollar checks or bigger to get into an action to a, even a small VC fund. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but they can take, you know, up to 99 investors and quarter million, half million dollar checks or bigger. And for us, we, we can take an unlimited number of investors. Minimum check is 500 bucks. You can download the app and you can put the money in yourself. And then we report everything back through the app, kind of a, you know, a way of having courtside seats, to the process. So you can go into the app right now. You can get education on how venture capital works, on how our specific fund works. You can see all the investments that we've made to date. Um, and then, you know, we share inspiring founder stories and whatnot that need, that will live in the app as well. And um, you can track your investments, of course, but you know it's it's a very kind of personal experience as you go through it. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. So, so I mentioned as an angel investor, um, one of the challenges that I've seen with some of these sort of fund models is a lack of due diligence and a sort of a herd mentality. Um, so, how do you kind of overcome that? It sounds like you've raised some money, so you have some weight that you can put behind it. But how do you overcome that? Yeah, well. You know, in, in regards to the fundraising, it's it's important, I think, to distinguish the two levels of sweater. So there's Sweater Inc., which is a fintech company where the technology lives, all that kind of stuff. So we've raised institutional capital, venture capital at that level to power the fintech company. Um, and that's different. They own part of us, you know, and our objective one day is to IPO or be acquired. Right. But then underneath that is the cashmere fund, which is the fund that is represented in the app. And that's what everyone can invest into we pool that money and we make investments out of that fund specifically. So when it comes to actually making investments and how we avoid herd mentality and all that kind of stuff, uh, we're very much, you know, I suppose, 
I mean, A, we're, we're an independent fund, right? So we make all of our own decisions. We have a, a deal team of about eight people here and all, all we do all day long, that team is just examine opportunities and talk to founders. So since the beginning of the year, we've, uh, we've had contact with about 1,500 founders. Um, we've interviewed about 450. We've made 14 investments. Um, you know, so by the end of this year, we will probably have made in the 40 to 50 investment range probably is where we're going to end up by the end of the year. Um, and we, we will have talked to, you know, thousands of, of founders. So it's, it's a process though. I mean, like every deal that we look at, we have to look at independently and say, does this have, does this company and do these founders have what it takes to actually make it to the next level? And, you know, as, as part of that equation is, you know, does it fit our thesis and like, how's our portfolio mix right now and all that kind of stuff too. Okay. So you, you have rigorously curated thousands or hundreds, if not thousands of, of companies in order to come out with, with the few gems. Oh yeah. Every time. Right. And I mean, we do look, we have a broader aperture for examining companies as, as we like to say, um, you know, cause like if you take, I don't know, a typical VC fund, right? So if you were to take this, the step from seed stage to series A, so just assume you've got a thousand companies that all raised a seed round from venture capital fund and it's been a year or whatever, and they're going to go raise a series A. So you examine all those, you take them and you hand them to any given VC fund. Most VC funds have a very narrow thesis. So that thesis is usually partially geography driven, vertical driven and stage driven. So like you might be in, I don't know, Utah, right? We invest in Utah companies that are SaaS based at seed stage. And that just took you all the way down to this really narrow thesis of type of company you're looking for. So if you hand those thousand companies to any given VC fund that's relevant for that stage, they're automatically going to take 900 and say, they're not a fit for our thesis, right? There's going to be a hundred left and they're going to say, you know what? I'm personally interested in 40 of these. I'm going to talk to them. They're going to do due diligence on a dozen of them and they're going to make investments in two, right? But when you look at that whole cohort um, of those thousand companies, there's actually about 400 of them will successfully raise a series A. So you examine that and you're like, okay, well, that's interesting. So they, they did enough that they actually advanced through the system. So was that VC a bad VC for passing on so many of them? Well, no, they just have a very narrow thesis, right? They're looking for something very specific and they're also applying their vision of the world and how they view the future, right? But that means that of all those 400 companies that raised the Series A, there's some VC that saw those and said, yeah, this has got the right components, right? It's just a different set of criteria. So for us, um, part of what's different about Sweater is that our fund is evergreen, which allows us to make hundreds of investments, maybe even thousands of investments, rather than a typical VC fund that might make a couple of dozen investments. Um, and so that allows us, uh, Evergreen means that we can raise money into it forever. So a typical VC fund, like if it's a $100 million fund, they'll spend 12 to 24 months raising all the money to raise that fund. And then they've got about three years to deploy all the money. And then they'll go raise another fund. And it's kind of this on off, on off process. But for Sweater, we can raise money constantly and in perpetuity into the future, which gives us some unique, um, I guess, experiences as an investor as well. Because like we can set up an investment subscription and you can sign up and put in a hundred bucks a month. And every time that you put that money in, it just grows your position in the fund. And traditional VC funds can't do that, right? So there's some unique elements that allows us to do that. But one of those is that because we don't have to deploy all the money in three years, we can look at a 10 or a, a 20 year horizon and we're just, we're, we're looking at that whole thing, right? And we know we're gonna make hundreds of investments. So it allows us to, to look at more of that macro level of investments rather than getting all the way down to this teeny tiny little sub segment and being just like extraordinarily exclusive. It doesn't mean we're not gonna invest in good companies. It just means that we can look at a, a circle that's a little bit bigger than the typical VC fund. Right, right. Oh, interesting. So, so, uh, so from a from an investor side, obviously you're targeting kind of um, well more average people, right? Right. The the <laughs> most of us. Uh, do you filter, or do you have a, a a filter on your thesis in terms of kind of a risk profile? Because I would imagine, like, my appetite for gambling may not be as much as, or or, or let's say I have more to lose than than somebody that uh, has deeper pockets, for example. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, like we feel like that balance, it's super individual, right? So when, when we make 
I, I don't know. We can't really make recommendations in the same way. Like, I mean, there's some regulatory stuff that I, my, I have to hung, hold my tongue on, <laughs> so to speak. So like, I can't tell anyone how much of their money they should put in. I also can't promise or imply a return profile for the fund. Uh, we're not allowed to do that, right? So what we can do though, is talk about industry, you know, kind of uh, expectations and what's average out there. So when you look at um, institutional investors that are professional, you know, they have a billion dollars that they have and they're allocating it across all these different assets. They typically put in, you know, five to 10% goes towards venture capital. Sometimes that includes venture capital and private equity, if you want to get into that nuance, right? But it really depends. I mean, there, there are some out there that allocate 25 to 30% into venture capital. And it's, it's interesting because there's a correlation there that they also perform the highest out of everyone that, that of professional allocators. Now, I'm not saying that that's what any individual person should do because the risk profile for an individual person is very different, right? And there's a lot more on the line than a big professional investor with a billion dollars to deploy. So it's really individual. You know, some people feel comfortable putting in 500 bucks, even though they have a $500,000 portfolio. Another person would look at that and say, I'm willing to put in $35,000 in my $500,000 portfolio. Totally depends on the person. Okay. And then um, from a founder perspective, right? What, what, what would a, how, how would a, how would sweater look attractive to, uh, to a founder? Oh, this is where it gets fun. <laughs> so it's, it's almost become like a joke amongst founders that VCs kind of, you know, puff their feathers up and walk around and say, look how different I am. I'm so amazing. You know, I've got these great connections and, you know, I'm going to help you on your board. You know, and we all, we're like, okay, yeah, like I need to have a good personal connection with you as my VC partner, right? And I, that needs to be meaningful. We need to be on the same page. Um, but everything else beyond that kind of becomes like everybody's money is pretty green. And, you know, everyone's connections are going to be unique in some way, shape or form, but they're going to run out after the first six months of working together, right? And it, that's kind of the end of it, right? And then like, then they're going to be a good partner. And that's what you really want as a good partner. Um, but sweater is a little different. And this is where the technology element of sweater comes into play. Because when you're a founder, let me just ask you a question. So when you're a founder, you know, who are you selling to? You're selling to people, just regular people, right? I mean, whether they are a business decision maker inside the four walls of whatever this business is doing, or whether they're a consumer and an, and, and an individual, it's ultimately a person that is making all these decisions. And this is where there's some magic behind Sweater. And one of the reasons we made this a, a mobile app, because we're bringing all of these people who are ultimately the buyers and decision makers of the products that we're building as founders, and we're bringing them into one place. And we're giving them an incentive to help your company be successful because they're an investor. So our pitch to founders is when you come in, we bring this very aligned community with us. And when we make this investment, they are now your, your best friends. They're your advocates, right? They're either going to purchase, promote, or champion your product, re, you know, regardless of where you're attacking the market, because ultimately you're selling to people. And we leverage technology to put that on steroids. It's not just an email that we send out. We can be very, very targeted and actually understand the preferences and the hobbies and the professions and the pain points of all of these people. So that when, you know, like I, I like to use this as an example. So my dad has dementia, all right? So my family has been going through this for the last five years. You know, it's, it's been kind of a wild ride. There's lots of material out there and stuff, and there's a few solutions, but not much, right? So <clears throat> within Sweater's platform, what Sweater could do is, is ask, like, you know, one of the questions, you know, are you or anyone in your family managing someone with dementia? And that could be a checkbox that I check. And now as the Cashmere Fund, we're out there in this world, in the world, and we have a founder that pitches us that they are you know, have a solution for people that are managing dementia within their family. Now, Sweater can go back and go, boop, boop, boop. Hey, how many people check that box? You know, and there's 17,000 people who say they're managing that. Well, now Sweater can do a couple of things, right? First, we're going to ask them a bunch of questions. What are you doing today? How, how does this affect your life? You know, what other solutions are out there? If you had a magic wand and could just solve a problem, how would you do it, right? Or what would you do? And we can use that to make wise decisions and decide whether or not this company actually has something. But then let's just assume that it does and we make the investment. We've also got 17,000 people that can promote that and can purchase the product or you know, can be a champion inside wherever that, that sales process needs to go. And that's something that no VC can offer today. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so there's a community support behind it. 
That's really cool. You know, I, I've I've noticed a change, somewhat a, a positive change in the VC uh, ecosystem. I think there's this, you know, there's this old mindset of like the vulture capitalist where sort of they give you they give you the money and now they've got you over the barrel and they tighten the screws and either you hit the targets or you get fired. Um, and, you know, they still exist, but I feel like there's sort of a new breed or I'm seeing a new breed where they really treat the portfolio like, hey, you know, <laughs> we made an investment. We want you to be successful and we're here to support you. Um, and in fact, I, so as an executive coach, I've partnered with several VC firms, um, and I offer, you know, some, some free coaching for, for people in the portfolio. Um, and in the traditional VCs, they say, well, that's my job, right? I'm, I'm the coach. It's my job to, to coach these folks. I think, yeah, but are you really like, are you really, are you, are you lifting them up? Are you helping them see their potential, breaking those barriers? Are you helping them with the follow through and accountability to really, you know, achieve those goals? Or are you just sort of talking because <laughs> you, you, you feel good about yourself. Um, but again, a newer breed is, is, is really seeing the value, uh, that I can bring and, and again, to their portfolio. And so here you've got that kind of on steroids where you've got, all sorts of different people, different backgrounds in that community that can step forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, there, there are a lot of implications to having a really, you know, well curated and activated community that can help these founders, you know, be successful. And there's a lot of discovery left to be had in, in terms of what it could become and what it can do. And it's, it's one of those things where it's um, the bigger the community gets, the more powerful it is. And it's, it's not, you know, uh, a one X kind of thing that going from 10,000 to 20,000, now you have twice as much power. It's somewhat exponential, right? 20,000 instead of 10,000 is more like three X the power and a hundred thousand instead of 20,000 is a very different game. Right. And so we're already, you know, trying to figure out the best way to grow this community and, and create that incentive and keep people aligned while also giving them a cool experience. You know, it's like, I, I used the courtside seats kind of example earlier. And it's like, yeah, okay, you get courtside seats. All right, you don't get to shoot the ball and you don't get to coach the team, but we will give you a tour of the locker room afterwards. And if you're lucky, maybe one of the players will fall out of bounds and get sweat on you or, you know, you get a, an autographed basketball or whatever, right? And you get to experience it like, like you're right there and you're a part owner of the team, which makes the game even that much more exciting, right? Oh, that's phenomenal. Um, so what, what, do you think, what do you think your firm's role is then in terms of supporting, you know, bringing the community together, but in terms of supporting the founders, do you see a place for you to provide resources to them? Oh, definitely. You know, I mean, you know, this being a founder is hard <laughs> and uh, the journey for each founder uh, is inherently very unique. Um, and the, and, and the talents and skills and, the, you know, the challenges that they face as an individual, you know, I mean, like, one element that we've talked a little bit about um, and explored is just, you know, <clears throat> I think that the emotional side of being a founder and the mental health side of being a founder has become much more front and center the last four or five years than it's ever been. Um, and we've talked a lot about like, how do we help founders through that, right? While also giving them kind of the, the safe space and the protection they need to be the, the tough leader that they need to be ultimately, you know, but while also taking care of themselves. And, um, you know, I think the sky's the limit. And as we continue to grow and build, we're going to identify the things that our founders need the most, and and we're going to give it to them um, because we're going to have the scale to do it. So nice, yeah. No, I I like I think I said I'm kind of seeing this shift. It's almost like how you know tech companies. I don't know several years ago started investing more in the mental and emotional health of their employees. Um, in some cases, all right, let's throw a ping pong table out there. But in other cases, it was a little bit more intentional. I'm seeing that transition to the to the VC world now as well, where the VCs not only provide the capital, but again, sort of the uh, the the community and the resources to help them actually achieve the growth that they're looking for. So, like you come into a, a portfolio, right? They inject you with capital. Well, they're entrusting a lot with you, and so they're trying to to coach you and support you to. Uh, to get to that next level of growth. Well, I think part of it too is that I think VCs have come to a realization that you, you can't muscle a company past the finish line these days. It's, you know, it, it's not the magical board member that's is going to somehow save the company and strip out the management and like make it sing somehow. It's like the window of opportunity is so, I don't want to say small, but like 
things are so competitive and the velocity of capital is so fast that if you mess that up, right, then there's, there's not ch- time often to come in and not even salvage. I mean, salvage might be the only word, but like much less actually get the win that you want. And so I think VCs are seeing that if they really want these companies to be successful, they, they've got to start earlier in the process and not just be crisis management when, when hard things happen, that there needs to be a better foundation for founders to build off from. And the smart VCs see that. Um, and there's a variety of ways that, that that's being approached, but there's some really great VCs out there. You know, I, I kind of, you know, we poke fun at VCs a little bit and there are some stereotypes out there. But there are some really excellent VCs too. And you know, founders are, are lucky to have good partners around them that, that believe because VCs have plenty to risk as well. It's not like they're sitting back there with nothing to risk. Yeah, well, and, and obviously the, you know, the way that the economy has shifted over the last um, eight or nine months or so has gotten a lot of people really scared. Um, VCs have really tightened the purse strings and pulled deals and, and shifted their risk profiles. Um, and that has rippled through, you know, the startup ecosystem um, in a lot of ways, causing people to make some drastic measures. Do you see this as an opportunity in some way for you to kind of either stand out or or um, address a part of the market that traditional VCs have maybe moved away from? I think potentially, you know, I mean, like we need to build on a very firm foundation out of the gates, no matter what, because we have a lot to prove. I mean, in many ways, we're an emerging fund. And so, you know, there's, there are elements of our experience in our investment approach and the technology that we're building and all these other things that are very foundational. So we won't be, you know, too fringe anytime soon, but I think that there are uh, plenty of opportunities. You know, we're, we're big believers of uh, in between the coasts. Like we love companies in San Francisco and New York, but like, especially post pandemic, you know, there was already a trend of companies being built pretty much anywhere. But post pandemic, it's truly you can build anywhere and you can build a team without anyone being in the same city and have the same level of success. And so, you know, over the next decade, we see that as an enormous opportunity that I think a lot of VCs are not well prepared for. They don't have the channels prepared to be able to take advantage of that. Um, I think that, of course, underrepresented founders are also a huge area that we're big believers in and that women and minority owned you know, companies have a lot to offer and they they understand I think um, spaces and products and opportunities and pain points that you know many of the rest of us just don't see because we don't experience it. And that by being able to tap into them and, and giving them a fair shot at coming in, that there's an opportunity there too. And I would say kind of an extension of that is almost like the, um, the socioeconomic factor, you know, which has some correlation sometimes with, with underrepresented groups, but also it's just across the board, right? That VC is often won by, by founders who are already plugged in, who already have the connections and the clout and the credentials of you know where they went to school and who their family was and who their dad knows and whatever else that get them into these circles faster and with more confidence um, from everyone around the table. And if you don't have those pre-existing relationships and credentials, it is very very difficult to find success in VC, no matter how good your idea is. And the only thing that can trump it is how much traction you have. And so money can buy you success in VC too, because if you can dump a lot of money into your idea, then you accelerate past all those other problems. But if you don't have relationships and credentials and you don't have your own money, it's just extraordinarily difficult to find success. And that's where I think there's a treasure trove of opportunity where there are founders that have great opportunity in front of them and they see something, but they can't finance it. They don't have the connections to break through. They're in between the coasts. And I think that that is what is truly untapped because you know, you've only got the top 10% of society that, you know, are truly able to accelerate through the VC fundraising process and everybody else, you know, you either got lucky or you really hit the nail on the head with your product. Right. And otherwise, like there's just not a lot of success to be had. So we're definitely building mechanisms for that. So, so are you, are you, is this then part of your thesis that you're, you're making this capital more accessible to founders as well that may not have those traditional connections? Yeah, we, we talk about it all the time. So like um, you know, one of the, I guess, channel developments that we have created uh, is a scout network. So, um, you know, usually to be a scout for a VC means that you, you know the guys running the fund, you know, and there's already a level of connectivity there, right? But we decided to do away with that. And we're like, look, we want scouts across the country and we're going to activate them to be able to identify what a good deal looks like. You know, it, it's like that. I, I have to go look up the name of that uh, 
that effect. But like, you know, like when you're starting to look for a new car and you're like, you know, I really like that new Ford Bronco. And then all of a sudden you just see Ford Broncos everywhere. It's like, where did these all come from? Like, and it, there, there's an effect for it, but it's like, once you start seeing it, then you see it everywhere. And it's the same way with startups. Like we all experience these products everywhere. You know, like we use venture backed, you know, products and technologies all over the place, but we don't always realize it. So what we do is we bring in regular folks to be scouts with us and they're, they're software engineers at Rivian, you know, and they were a founder over here and they, they used to be an angel investor and they, you know, all these other things and they're just regular folks. And then we teach them what we're looking for. And now in their everyday life, they're just looking around. They're like, Hey, I, I saw this really cool company. And so out of those 1200 ish companies that I mentioned that we've like actually seen the decks on this year, um, I believe 20% of them or 25% came from our, our actual scout network. So we've got 150 scouts across the country. So, you know, 250 of those deals, uh, I guess more like 350 of those deals came from that network and about 15% of the investments that we've made came from scouts who introduced us and we're just getting started. I mean, that's the exciting thing. You know, we've got another 1200 applications to be scouts that we haven't been able to process because there's so much demand to participate with us. And so we're actually, we're developing different levels of the programming right now that we want to, to roll out to give more people the opportunity to do that. And the last point I'll just say on that is that the effect that we've seen is that because it's regular folks from all walks of life and every socioeconomic status that you can imagine, we, the, the diversity of founders that are coming in the door is phenomenal, unlike anything that I've seen anywhere in venture capital. And so it's like, we're getting these hints of what's possible by tapping into the regular everyday person. And it's powerful, you know, and we're going to scale it up to a, to a level that no one's ever seen before. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. I love to hear it. Um, that is, you know, one of the challenges that I've seen the most with remote first companies is, hey, if you're not in the Bay Area, you're not networking with the traditional VCs, you're not getting the opportunities, right? You might get seed, maybe some angel money, but to get to those VCs, you still got to fly to to San Jose. Um, and, and even though the VCs have tried to change and branch out more, there's still that gap. They're not connecting because they're not where the founders are. Um, so to be able to provide that, not only the accessibility on the, on the investor side, but on the founder side as well, that, that is, that's really special. Yeah, we're working on it. You know, I mean, there's, uh, there's always more to build. Uh, oh, that's, that's amazing. No, I really, I really, I love that mission. Um, it's something that, you know, like you said, there's just so much untapped potential out there. I can't tell you how many great ideas or great founders or great teams that I've seen that, you know, really the, the chasm that they couldn't cross was, was getting access to that later stage capital. Um, so yeah, you need to, you need to win. You need to go do this. <laughs> All right. Appreciate the encouragement. We'll make it happen. <laughs> um, Wonderful. Well, so, um, so I guess as we kind of to, to start to wrap up here, um, I, I always like to kind of just get to know your, your leadership style a little bit more. Um, and so, you know, do you have guiding leadership principles or anything that you think of as you're kind of going through your life or managing your team or what have you? Oh yeah. I mean, there's, there's a few out there. I'm a huge believer in autonomy, um, you know, and giving people the confidence, uh, and the definition to be able to operate and actually go, you know? Um, that can be really hard, I think, as a leader to be able to define it clearly enough uh, for people to be able to do that. And to me, there's two sides of that coin. It's like, you can provide autonomy on paper or verbally, but the other side of that is if you don't provide um, the mental safety, say, to be able to make mistakes and have failure, then that autonomy is going to be muted because people will, fall down to the lowest level of risk taking possible so that they don't make mistakes if they are, you know, if there's fear of reprisal or losing their job. And so if you really want the most out of people and the most out of autonomy, you need to A, be able to clearly communicate that and make sure that they understand where, you know, their rope can lead them and where they have the ability to go make decisions. But at the same time, you have to foster a, a culture of being able to make mistakes and not be fired for it. And that that you know, I don't know that you necessarily need to celebrate mistakes. I don't necessarily go that far, but you do need to have the comfort to know that like, oh, you know, that was a mistake. Let's keep going. What did you learn? Let's keep going, right? Like, how can we do it differently next time? Let's keep going. And to not have this like 
you know, being reprimanded and like making people feel bad. Cause nobody likes that. Like, I mean, you, you already know you made a mistake. You feel bad enough, you know? And so that's one that that's really, really important to me that we focus on an awful lot here. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of funny and counterintuitive, I guess that, uh, you know, everyone talks about innovation and at the same time, they're risk averse, you know, they, they don't like, they don't like to fail or they, they put too much focus on mistakes. Um, but yeah, you really do need to give people that, that, that space and that, that support, um, to go try things and fail and learn from those failures and, and keep moving forward. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I think that, you know, big companies have such a hard time with innovation, like true innovation, not incremental stuff, you know, is that they, they can't get out of their, they can't get out of the way of failure, you know, it's like that failure is, is not tolerated. And how can you ask someone to swing for the fences when if they swing and they miss, they lose their job, you know, like who, who in their right mind is going to do that? And so, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just unsurprising to me when big companies are like, well, innovation, it's so hard. And it's like, well, that's your fault. Let's be honest, guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So they move along that continuum. They move kind of the, you know, the growth, the land and expand, and then they move into that defensibility stage in their, in their enterprise. And yeah, once your job, once, once you build the moat, <laughs> it's really hard to go explore, right. And, and find new opportunities. Um, so yeah, I get, I, you know, when I do get brought into large enterprises and they ask, you know, how do we recapture that startup magic? It's well, you know, give people some freedom, give people some, some opportunity to try new things and fail and, and, uh, and don't worry if it doesn't, uh, work out according to plan. In fact, it, it probably won't work out according to plan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I found so much of innovation is just like, it's almost accidents, you know? It's like a good brainstorming session, you know, like you get five or 10 people in a room, you have an objective and you just start brainstorming, you know, no idea is a bad idea. You put everything on the whiteboard and you just like go for it. Right. No one gets laughed at. And it, it almost always seems like the best ideas stem from a trigger that came because of a bunch of stupid ideas. And when you lined them all up, you're like, but well, what about this? Right. And it like unlocks this next level. I mean, it's almost like that with innovation. It's like you have all these stupid mistakes and this stuff that doesn't work and you're trying different things and all of a sudden one of them works. But the only reason it was ever tried was because you went through a series of mistakes to get to that thing and you never could have thought of, thought of it or have discovered it because it was hiding behind what was necessarily a bunch of things that couldn't work, right? That were more logical. And I don't know, so many people are just like, they deny that. They think that innovation is just this thing that you go pick up at the grocery store it's like, no, absolutely not. Are you kidding? Innovation is freaking hard. Right. Or that idea comes fully formed, you know, just divine intervention, whatever, divine inception. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this, there is this uh, concept it, mainly in, in content or in writing called sort of clearing the spigot. And so a lot of writers will, will have this process where you, you got to get the bad ideas out of your head first before the good ones will come. Right. And so you, you, you just write, you write all sorts of concepts, you, you write and you scrap things, you throw it away. And after a lot of time doing that, eventually the good ideas will start to flow. So it's the same kind of thing with innovation, right? You got to try things, let them fail, experiment, and then something will start to take shape. Um, but again, if you were, if you, if you based it on your first one or two or three failures, uh, well, you, you'd never get anywhere. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Um, great. Well, so are there any other, uh, kind of messages or final thoughts that you'd like to, to send to our audience? No, oh, shoot. I mean, if I were to talk to anybody, I'd talk to founders, you know, any founders you have in your audience. I mean, I don't know. Here's the thing about being a founder. It never gets any easier. It's always hard. And to me, it like, if you go back way back to the beginning of this conversation, talking about endurance sports, you know, you're signing up for a marathon or a century ride or an Ironman you are absolutely not signing up for a walk in the park. And, and, and when you start the journey, you are literally unprepared to be able to do that level of performance of what you have to get to. But there is a way that you can train yourself to get through that and to be able to advance and actually be capable and, and, and almost worthy, so to speak, to compete at that level. But you have to earn your way to get there. You don't just walk out and do it. And it's that process that takes a lot of patience. It, takes a, it requires a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort, doing things that you're not good at, doing things that you hate to do, 
Like I hate swimming. <laughs> I really hate swimming and I avoid it all the time. But then I really suck at swimming when I go out and actually have to swim in a triathlon. And it's like, if, if I want to be any good at, at doing Ironmans, I have to swim, which means I have to prioritize it. I have to do these things I don't want to do. And over time I become better at them. And it's the same thing with entrepreneurship, you know? And so when, when you bite off that vision, you know, it's this element of saying, I've got an idea that I think is cool and interesting and has a lot of potential. And eventually you get to this point where it's like most people right now, if I said, hey, you want to go out and do an Ironman? They're going to be like, no way, that's nuts. I, I can't do that. I have no interest in doing that. Or I have enough context to know that it's crazy or whatever, right? And that's going to be the initial reaction. And, you know, for, for some people, they might be like, hey, that sounds kind of cool, but it's almost out of ignorance that you're going to miss it, you know, that you don't know what you're getting into, like I did, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> um, but you get to a point where all of a sudden you, you, you have to cross this, this barrier of the difference between having interest or seeing potential in something and actually having deep conviction that you need to make it reality. And you don't get that on day one. It absolutely, it doesn't matter how cool your idea is or how it stemmed. You don't have conviction on day one. I'm a firm believer in that. Conviction comes from going through the grind and actually forcing yourself to have these experiences that are hard where you get to a point where you have to decide if you're going to keep going or not. And that, that's a crappy day when you get to that point because all kinds of stuff will have happened and conspired against you that's going to make you feel like, why am I doing this? And Every founder will get to that point. And when you get to that point and you decide that you are going to do it anyway, that's conviction. And once you get that, nothing will stop you, especially if you figure out how to survive financially on your own. Nothing can stop you from making that possible. And so it's like this, it's this really long experience that is very painful. And somewhere along the way, you, you have to cross over and you'll have this experience of discovering true conviction. So for all the founders out there, you can find it. It's going to be a sucky process to get there and it's going to hurt a lot and you're probably going to lose a bunch of money and your life is going to get upended in one way or another. But if you can endure long enough to find that piece and then keep going, that's going to be what takes you to success. Oh, that's phenomenal. No, I love that. I love the, the Iron Man analogy here is perfect, right? It's don't just go out and run an Iron Man without training for it, without preparing yourself, which is, I think, what a lot of founders do. Um, but challenge yourself and push yourself along the way when you reach that point where it gets really hard you have to make that call and you know what there's there's nothing wrong with walking away but once you've decided that's what i'm going to do then you got to push through and have that discipline to make it to the top right that's incredible um well, great. Well, thank you so much for, for, for coming on the show today. It was really a pleasure talking with you. Like I said, I, I really believe in and support your mission. Um, and I will definitely connect with you afterwards to uh, become a scout and, and see if there's any other way I can help you in your portfolio. Awesome. Yeah. Welcome to that conversation. And it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on.